quarter. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, Ellie, and uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Ellie, Elnaz Nurizade. So, but you can call me Ellie or El, as Australian call me. And, and uh, you're an artist. You're going to tell us about your art? Yes, I am an artist. But that's a good question. I had a conversation with my supervisor in RMIT about if artists can call themselves artists or is it something that other people should call the artist artist. But yeah, I call myself artist. So I'm a ceramist and a sculptor and time to time I do installation art. Yeah. Okay. Is that with um, all with ceramics or all to do with uh, ceramics and ceramic related um, disciplines? I would say 70 to 80 percent I use clay and ceramic but then I use other materials as well but I normally go with the really basic materials like paper and things wire and things that you can easily find I don't work with the more complex art is mainly the most basic thing that you can find around so that's my material but yeah, time to time I fire them and glaze them, which they become ceramic. But then I use raw clay as well in my installation art. Um, but mainly it's ceramics that you're doing. Um, where's the start? Where's the start? Where, 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 where did all, all this uh, begin? Oh, like old, long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> so... Um, I started doing ceramic when I was, it's a, a bit of discussion between if I started at 12 or 14 between me and my mom. My mom thinks I started at 12. I think I started at 12, at 14. But we are having this discussion, is it 12 or 14? But I say 12, 14. So teenager time I started. My, dad, my mom and dad, they had a studio, lampshade making studio. And they had a client which was my ceramic supervisor Mariam Salur and she used to make her ceramic and bring it to my parents and they made a lampshade for them so my mom and dad met her during while they were working and they become a close friend uh, when I was 12 or 14 my dad asked me do you want to do some pottery I said yeah why not and he told me you have to pay for yourself I'm not going to pay for your classes he said okay and I said okay I will pay you for a semester and then after that you can decide so I went to summer uh, pottery classes at my teacher my mentor studio and I think we, I was talking with her she said she was the first it was one of the first classes for pottery for kids in Tehran and before that there was not many kids classes so I was learning pottery there and after the first summer I I love it so much and then I told my dad that I want to continue and he said you have to pay yourself and I'm not going to pay you for your classes so I had a argument with my parents I didn't talk to them for two weeks and I didn't say anything to my dad. I was so upset and he said, whatever, I'm not paying for your classes. But then he started buying all of my ceramics. So the first semester, what I made. Oh, he, he bought the cera ceramics you made? Yes. Oh, yeah. cool. And yeah. he just like made the argue that, oh, yeah, I need something for my friend's gift. I need to buy something. And he started, my mom and dad, both of them, they start buying my ceramics that I used to make as in that summer so I collect some money for to pay for my next semester so that's how it began and this is in Iran yes. right? yeah yeah that's back in Tehran in yeah. Iran yes um so why why I mean you kind of explained why pottery and why ceramics but why not something else what um it is a it is a really good question. I kept asking myself, is it something that I'm doing it because I started when I was young or is it something that I really want to do it? But it's an addiction. So when you get to clay, clay does something weird. It's just, 
it changes you it just kind of molds you to different person so i don't think i can live without clay it's just it made me something else i'm just completely another creature when i work with clay so it's hard it's really hard it's really physical in my body and sometimes i feel like i might not be able to do it for a long time because it's super physical it push a lot it puts a lot of pressure in body but uh i think i'm i just love it i can't live without it yeah <laughs> Yeah, pottery, definitely pottery. I'm I'm not familiar that familiar with like, you know, art history in Iran or anywhere in the world really, but especially Iran. Um is there a lot of pottery in in um Iran's kind of history in in, in terms of trade and art and things like that? Yeah. Iran has a really long history, just like there are some places that you can go 5000 or 7000 years old species that you see they can find pots there so definitely it has a big history on pottery and then specifically in Iran there is a city called Hamedan Hamedan is a city that most of the jobs are actually a small city next to Hamedan called Lalejin but all of the people who work there they are potters so it's just city of the potters and then when you want to buy pottery you go there and then we have other uh, cities like Tabriz or Yaz, they are based around pottery. It's really traditional in Iran and there are so many potters, but mainly they use blue colors in north of Iran. In Tabriz they use blue color and then in Lalejin they use brown and green. It's a really, yeah, it's an ancient. Is that is that because of materials available in the area? I don't know, but it's really interesting that how to see how they limit it with those colors is not like the pottery opposite than all of the glasswork or other uh, the carpet and everything the pottery is not that colorful in Iran and they we have some drawing of the pottery in Yazd and other cities which they have a bit of colors but to be honest while I was learning it wasn't we didn't have that much color but yeah it's a really traditional thing but the way i learned it was more european style because my mentor she studied in france and then she came she learned pottery in france not in iran and then she came back to iran and start teaching and using the similar technique that she used in europe that's one of the reasons, if you look at my pottery, it's not like everyone asks me, like, you follow up the traditional way, but I think I'm completely, completely opposite the traditional way. The but traditional Iranian way. Iranian yeah. way, yeah. And But my design is more like, if I want to describe it, it's more like a carpet design in Iran, but I'm doing them on pottery time to time. But it's uh, the style is kind of my puts. I say something. It's like me. It's hanging from two sides, half ir- uh, traditional way, half European style. The same as I am now, half half. And that, and that and you put that down to you, just your teacher. The. Uh, good, good question. I. I think that was a big effect. That was a really big effect because the a magazine she had, it was about like Ceramic Monthly or all of the magazine that was coming from um, Europe. And I was going through those and then learning about Juan Miro or like Henry Mathis and all of those amazing painter while I was there reading all of those uh, magazine and books. And what happened because I started pottery when I was young, I kind of, in the early age, I got directed to the place that I wasn't fitting in other kids, like in the school and other thing. I had a kind of direction that was kind of flipping toward more European style. And then being more alone and spending more time with myself, making my pots. So it's kind of all of those things affected me to not feel completely connected to 
Iranian style. But definitely in my work, now I'm not talking about the, my personality and life, I'm just talking about my work ceramic. So that had a huge impact. But also um, the issue with uh, ceramic or any art, I think it's everywhere probably. It needs, you need to be in the group of people and you grow up with them and change. But because I didn't study art in Iran, I never got mixed up with the artist society of Iranian artist group. And then we were a really a small group of friends, which we were kind of gathering together to at, in my mentor's house. Um, we were like kind of selected people, which we weren't connected with other people. So that made another effect, which we were kind of separate from whole of the thing that was the branches that was growing in Iran. How, how does, how, um, it, in terms of, uh, you know, society at large in Iran, what's the approach to uh, maintaining kind of a traditionalist style of art? I'd imagine in Iran, um, it, it, very uh, protective of their yes. history and, and, and culture and things like that. Is mm. there kind of, is it frowned upon a little bit, like kind of doing what you did, uh, bringing a kind of European flavour into it's, Iranian art? It's not easy to do, no. They are really um, protecting and protecting and more preservative. Like they want to go, you go with the style of Iranian style, like bringing calligraphy in art. It was one of the, like the way, before I come to Australia, it was so popular, like everyone was getting to, bringing calligraphy in art, in your scarf, in your clothes, in your pot, everything just suddenly become like calligraphy. But a couple of times I got rejected from many of the exhibition because they wouldn't accept my work. They wouldn't see it as a style of pots. Because who, who are these people that were it's, uh, um, institutions that were knocking you back? Uh, institution of like a ceramic association of, Ceramic Association of Iran that they were basically on the University of Art. So they were around those area which they were organizing all of the biennial or other exhibition. They wouldn't accept us. And then the other thing was that there were, there were a bit of challenge with my teacher getting accepted as well because she was using a lot of mix of sculpture and more uh, organic minimal ceramics which in Iran, like, they like to add a lot of details, a lot of design and different patterns. So it was always a challenge to accept her as well as us. So it was a kind of, we were kind of packaged that we were outside other world. But then for a couple of biennial, she got accepted to be a, one of the curators or like one of the organizers. From those two, we could exhibit our works in it as well. So I could exhibit two biennial in Iran. So how did that happen? I mean, if they didn't like her work, I don't know. It was why a, would they offer her a, a curatorship, basically? It's, it was a weird situation, I think. It, so Megan was really a strong woman. So she, she is, still she is. So she has a really, I think, I don't know. It's a bit hard to describe it. So when you grow up in Tehran as a female artist, you need to fight. You need to fight for every right that you want to get. Like, it's not easy to live as a female artist. And then female artist, that's a business. So she was earning money from her art. She wasn't like doing many of the artists in Iran like, or, or around here. They are teachers in university and do other stuff and then do their art as well. But Mariam was, uh, she just focuses on her art and she earns money from her art. So she needs to have the, she needed to have a lot of good disciplines. And that was a, I think that was the main cause of issues that people were thinking that she's so hard to deal with. So, but she was so persistent and then trying to move things. So there were so many people that started to connecting with her a bit easier because she was good. She was, she's good at what she does. And I think those kind of things, it just made her to become more connected. 
So that's I think that was why that happened. Yeah, I, I think places like that, like Iran, need because uh, they're quite resistant to change. Need people like that to to kind of push it a little bit and. I'd like to know what your your take is on that because I'm sure there's a lot of the traditional, especially just in terms of art, traditional art that you love and I'm sure you wouldn't want to see that eroded away but at the same time you want to see things progress and you want to be able to um, put your own flavour on things. Is there what, Where's the balancing point for that? I don't see there's a balance. I, I see this talk about balance now is that I, I see it as more like a dialogue between the what I do and what the traditional way is. Like the I better to describe this then I go back to the same subject talking. I was look, uh, looking at um, Sydney Meyer artist she, he's a Australian painter and he has a series called Persian 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 Garden I think it's called Persian Garden and Shiraz. So he painted all of those things when he had to travel to Iran. And I didn't know about him, but then like in one of those researchers searches, I found him. And then I found one of his Persian design. It was exactly similar to what I paint in my ceramics, which was crazy. It was crazy to suddenly you see an Australian person went to Iran, paint something that has a similar pattern, similar structure, which I painted in my pots. So what I see as a tradition and the things that art is, has a root in it, there is a root, there is something that we can't lose it. Like even an Australian person goes there, it grasps it. It's just like there is some soul, there's, I, don't, I shouldn't call it soul, but there is a root there that you can't lose it. So with heritage art, I think as much as we force things to, we have to say with this side our that is, is actually we losing it more. But if I see it as a stepping ground, like a stepping stage that you learn about them, you get the things like, I love carpet in Iran and I see all of those things, but it doesn't mean I have to repeat the similar thing to protect it. I think the good art can improve and it can change, but you still can see like, those balance, it has the same root. You can recall those things. Like with my design, as soon as I call them European style, because I use a lot of colors, but as soon as people see it, they connect with my Iranian background, which brings all of those use of colors in our carpet, in our uh, architect, in our like everything, like it's part of the culture. So you can't, we can't lose it. So that's why I'm thinking it's not just a balance between what I want to input it or what's the heritage. I think it's just like a conversation. I go and see them, come back, transfer it, filter it through me, and then put it back and read other stuff. It's always like a conversation between them. Do you, do you see a parallel here with art here? Is there a, I don't know, an element of... Uh holding on to the past? Uh, is there an element of, of, of that sort of attitude in Australian art, do you think? Yeah. That's a hard question to answer. I'm not really an art critic or things like that that I can say. I think we should ask all of the lecturers to answer that question. But what I... I'm, I'm, I, I'm asking that because you, all, because you studied there and here. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that, obviously. But I yeah, didn't you, study art in Iran. Oh, you didn't study art in Iran? No, I did industrial design. Well, you studied there, though. Yeah, but so, I didn't study art. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, So you studied there and you studied here. So yeah. you would have seen it through school, that the, the yes. attitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, I don't know. We had this conversation with one of my friends. She thinks like here... People are more professional than Iran. But I think in the academic style, I, I see everyone as the same. So it's just like some stuff is, they want to put things in a box and they want to shape everything as they are. So the issue with Australian way of seeing art I have, which I shouldn't call it issue, but it's just like 
the challenge an issue. yeah <laughs> the challenge so i think we are so far away from everything and then you see something and they like definitely with iranian style oh, we have these flies flying um you, they see for example i said they see some iranian artists and they think oh my god this is amazing it has a lot of all of those calligraphy side or like one of my friends was saying um she had a conversation with one of the lecturer she was talking about her work but then in middle of her conversation she started counting in hebrew but then the lecturer got so fast, he said, oh, you should title your work with the, that number that you said. But uh, we, we were kind of talking and laughing. He said, as soon as something sounds a bit foreigner and nice, like if I say something in Farsi, it sounds so poetic. It suddenly they think, oh, this is awesome. This is amazing. But like we have so many of the good Iranian artists here, which they're just repeating other people's work. And like in Iran, like so many of the artists, they've done it 20 years ago. I'm here 10 years and yeah, 15 years ago. And the artists who are repeating them here, like Australian things, oh, this is amazing. This is so good. And so they get... It's almost like a bit of a, a fetish. It is. <laughs> and, and they don't... And I think it's just like the issue is that we are so far away from everything. Like if that happens in Europe, Europe, they, there are so many Iranian or other cultural artists, they go and come back and see, like people at least get more familiar with the arts that was doing before. But then we can't call it an issue because we are repeating ourselves. Doesn't matter we are repeating other people, we are repeating if it's a good thing or not. But I think it's just like that being so far away as an Australian, everything that sounds a bit like foreigner is so awesome yeah. and they don't research what is wrong with them i i think some of that's got to do with you know we live in australia a very safe country a very good country but it's also safe, a country safe. with uh in some ways there's a lot of history here mm -hmm. but in other ways there's almost no history so when we come across people that come from lands and places that have a, a lot of history. Mm. Um, I think uh, as Australians, we get excited about it. Yeah. You know? um, it's a, that's a really good point. I was, um, another conversation, I, you see we were talking that I should talk about talking. <laughs> I had another conversation with a guy. He was asking, he said, what do you think about, like, how do you feel? You have all of those culture, thousand and thousand years culture from Iran, and then you suddenly come here, and there's nothing. Don't you miss those culture? But it is a weird, it is a weird conversation. It is, it is just really, unreal. yes, we don't have uh, architecture. We don't have human, like the progress of the, what is the word for it is I can't find it now. I'm thinking in Farsi. Like how people grow up and we build a society. Um, we don't have the society building a structure in Australia, but no one knows. We have about, like Australia has about, I think 70, I think in only Australia we have 75, 750 types of just gum trees. And the way they grow, they, the way that they behave, the way they communicate together. I think we just have to shift the way we see the culture in Australia. We are so close that the culture and the behavior is just here. And we kind of ignore the culture that is much, much before than humanity. It's a culture, like the way that tree talks to each other, the way they plan things, the way that animals behave, how they create their territory, or the magpie, the behavior of the magpie. Those ones I see it as a culture, but it's just like, yes, there's not that much culture in Australia, but we have to go beyond that limit of the time that human exist, existed, so to find a culture, real culture here. Not human existed, maybe human existed as well, but like the time that everyone started building the houses and the 
five, seven thousand years. Well, it's funny because we have like two histories here. Yeah. We have colonizer history and mm-hmm. Aboriginal history. Yeah. And it's looked at as two separate things. Right or wrong? I don't know. That's yeah. This is not the podcast for that debate, yeah. I guess, but that's the reality of it. People yeah. see two different histories here. Um, but that's the way I see it anyway. Um, which is, it's funny because, you know, there is a rich history in Australia of art. You know, there's there's paintings in, in caves here mm-hmm. that date back, you know, well before anyone from Europe came along. Right. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's got me thinking now. Well, I've got a lot to think about now about the history of this country. It's interesting. Um, yeah, it, it, is a, it is an interesting conversation to go deep in it because, like, we, you were talking about how the heritage, how the roots affects you. So... Like recently, I started using all of those dots, dot, dot, dot in my painting, which the reason I started, I felt like I want to spread the peace with the situation that's happening in through the world. And I thought maybe the peace can be sliced in a small dots and then I can spread it around. So in my painting, I started to do the dots, dot, dot. But then it just directs me back to Aboriginal painting that they use that simple dot, dot, dot to paint. So it is fascinating to go, I know you say it's a two different culture we see it, but it is really important to see, okay, there is a culture of the colonizing, yes, that doesn't, doesn't bring any root or doesn't bring anything because all of the situation and complexity that happened. But then if we see it as a long year, connection to Aboriginal, yes, there is a big history. Mm. And then they know how to show the importance of the culture, which is the real culture of Australia, which is tree, nature, animals, and everything like that. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you, do you take, um, where do you take inspiration from? From You mentioned nature a few times. Do you take inspiration from nature as well? I mix things a lot. So, it's, you know, um, I didn't describe this, but I should have said at the beginning of our conversation, my work is about like how I see the image, how everything affects in my head. And then I have these visual shapes that appears and then I'm just suddenly grasping them and then painting them in my ceramics or making a sculpture and grasping those feelings what happened which I think is nature is part of it like the trees I love trees I love gum trees I just love the gum trees when you see those gum trees like some of them they decided okay I just want to go straight up I'm not breaking any rules I'm just going straight up 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 but then you see an artist gum tree that is just like say oh okay now I will go that way and see what happens and then do all of those other things and then you see the other type of gum tree they actually crawl kind of go round and round and then there are like those ones that have a goldy and silvery colors as well like depends on the shine of the the season and also shine of the the sunlight they behave differently like they shimmer shimmer and say look at me look at me so nature is just in australia i don't think we can ignore that inspiration like if I was in Iran, I wouldn't get that inspiration because it's just the sound of the birds here is different. The color of the sky is different. The tree behavior, like you see all of those weird trees around. It's just everything they do. They create different patterns. Is it really, it's really that different? Like It is huge. Um, it's, it's a big difference. It is. A big so what's it like in Iran? Tehran is really, uh, we have trees, but the trees are, you know how you see the cart? No. How should I describe it? Like normal trees. They are just brown truck with green top. Blah, 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 blah. I'm sure there's something special about them. There must uh, be something special. I don't know. Gum trees, trees here and nature here. It, it is weird. It's not real. It feels like it's just your 
in that life that they are doing some other stuff i don't know there is we had this conversation with Bez as well so we went to vancouver two years ago and he thought the nature of vancouver is beautiful but i thought it's just so card postal it's just like the way they advertise things the way that everything should look good it's a heaven things with the amazing lake reflecting the light and the trees are reflecting and all of the trees are standing perfect straight 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 and big green patches and thing but what i like about australia is that you see the grass and you exactly can see where the light the sun hit it because it's so hot and you see that yellow patch but then you go a bit further next to that I don't know, it's one of those uh, bottle tree and things the, with the pinky, the shitty thing, thing, thing. And then you see the grass is, gets much greener and then the way they behave, they go. Away. And then suddenly you walk and see all of those brown, 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 brown branches. Or while you walk in the bush, you suddenly get to the patch that got burned and you have all of those black, mm. harsh thing. And it's just the pattern is constantly changing. It's it's not it's not just beautiful it, what what's really interesting is how was, we were talking earlier and you said your you know people in australia and your uh, lecturer of yours yeah. was fascinated about your culture yeah but you're just as fascinated but just in a different way yeah and i just think it's about something you know there's something different that you haven't experienced before and it mm. gets you excited i think does that does that that's a good point traveling around and like had you stayed in iran do you think your art would have progressed in the same way it has after having moved here um it would be completely different way i don't see it. i think if i was in iran first i wouldn't be able i had to fight for whatever i wanted to do so like as I said, female artists and the way that you want to grow. Even I was so lucky with the supportive family. I would have have more challenges and I think I would have more struggling to do what I want to do. And then probably money would become more problematic and then selling my work would be much harder. And of those situations, I probably would have, maybe I would, do all like any other artist in Iran go more political, more activist, and more f the art that is more active instead of concentrating more on the beauty and sharing happiness and things like that. I probably would have, maybe I think I would have go really crazy and go political probably. Have you ever made? Have you ever made um, political art? I don't think we cannot make political art. I think it's just like in modern world, I see any move, even if I breathe, is political. It's just, I'm sitting here, female artist, back in Iran, and I'm talking, and i having all of those rights to talk. So it's political. I, I guess I'll rephrase the question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> activist art. Activist style. No. Have you ever made it? Would you? Oh, I, yes, I should say, I shouldn't say, no, I haven't made it. I made the Women Like Freedom installation last year, was it last year, last year. So last year we had a situation in Iran, um, Masajina Amini, they got killed with the morality police. And while that happened, I was back in Tehran. And it was a huge effect. It was a big, big shock that how those, things affects you so when i came back i made the i we become uh, one of my friends she contacted me and she said she's organizing an exhibition about the same situation women life freedom in iran do you want to be part of that and i said yeah i want to do an installation art so i made the big installation art which we had which i made news from scarves and then there were like a ceramic vases. They were sitting underneath of the nooses that they had the painting of female with the freedom bird. And I make a lot of freedom birds as well. That's one of my concept that freedom bird is them. It's an element that keeps coming. So I made that 
political that I call it poly active uh, artwork but um, it was a big challenge it was a really big challenge because um, I see my work I prefer to see my work as a more fundamental level of change I don't want to see it more I don't know it's a bit hard to describe it I believe I don't believe as a in a radical movement so I don't think that one direct move that you try to change everything will help I think it's actually the force that we're putting in it it affects to get the big reaction so I see the the way that universe works as a small changes a small changes that things that when we make a small changes that help us to create a larger change but when we act like a strong I think we get that heat that force that happens which I think we get the big shot come back so I made that artwork because I was just everything was here it just got stuck you need to let it go so I made that work and it was a relief I'm so glad I did it because I couldn't handle all of those pressure but I don't think I can handle it all the time because after I made that work and then I curated another exhibition in leather art space which was about women life freedom as well um, the pressure become much stronger like a couple of months I had a big meltdown I couldn't handle my pressure because I had that I could see that huge effect I was getting the feedback I was just shaking 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 so I couldn't keep my balance so for me I like to create a small changes that's why I still make mugs and even though I talk with everyone and everyone say oh you are your artist you can do everything you can do your installation art while you are making mugs I think like every mic, if I make every mic and I'm making till now, I think I made more than 3000 mugs. If I can add a small bit of happiness to everyone's life, I think I save everyone. If I save 10 minutes life that they are not thinking about the negative thing while they are drinking their coffee or tea, I'm saving like, I don't know, calculated 3000 in 10 minutes. It just... I'm building that small change, which is more in a larger area, but shallower, which I go like a needle and hit the things, but then I get the reflect, reflex back. I think in the longer run, in the long run, I, th I, I, and I've, you know, I should tell people yeah. who are listening here, yeah. Ellie and I are friends, yeah. <laughs> been friends for a few years. I, I think you, your approach is, um, is is the correct approach to improving the I world it's a you know sim we've had a lot of conversations it's what i do in mm. in my work i have no kind of political activist or activist type uh, agenda with uh, anything i'm doing and there's nothing wrong with no. doing that kind of art but i think it becomes a problem when there's too many people doing it mm. like anything and yeah, I think it's great. And you make beautiful mugs. I have a few floating yeah. around the house, as you know. And, yeah. and um, yeah, spread a bit of cheer. I think art needs yeah. to do that sometimes, you know. It just doesn't seem to have the impact of it's other good. other kind of types of art, you know, that that kind of shock people a little more. And so you've got a bit more of a battle yeah. there for recognition, I think. Yeah, yeah. I uh, that that's one of the thing is that we talk about like recognition and becoming famous. Famous depends on where. If I want to describe it, I see myself famous because like I have three thousand at least people. They have my work, and it's a fame. But where is the level of fame? Yes, not people in the art big industry that who are exhibiting NGV and things they won't see my work yes I should say I have a big one of my collector is a she's a designer of NGV I think that she does the dress 
design of the NGV section, the dress side. So she's one of my collectors. I think she has about 10 or 12 of my works now. A lot, I think. Or maybe less. I don't know. She, she was, she, that's, that's like someone told me that she's collecting my work. And she's having my work since I moved to Australia, like the, one of the pieces I made in 2014, she has them. So if I want to say, I kind of call it famous, but then where is the fame in which level? I think maybe the homeless in, in Flinders Lane, he's famous as well between all of other homelesses and people around it or the people who care about those people because he just sit down and do something amazing. I mean, in your opinion, I mean, is 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 fame the, for lack of a better word, is fame the right goal to be aiming for if you want to be an artist? Hmm. Fame brings money and money brings freedom <laughs> and we go to a loop of things, but... <laughs> It really depends. It's just, I don't see if, if I see an artist who wants to be famous, I don't see it. Why not? So I have a friend that she works amazingly and she works hard and I'm pretty sure she will be super famous one day. And I have friends back in Iran that they, they started even later than me, but the way they sell in their works and exhibiting in a big galleries and exhibition, they are famous. But I don't say it is a wrong goal. I say it's we have to find it if it's for us or not. Like I have this challenge, I constantly think about it. I want to be able to balance the amount of time I can spend in the studio and in my garden and then while I'm working, if someone knocks my door, I can open it and then talk and create the conversation without overthinking, oh my God, I have hundreds of exhibitions in, I don't know, maybe in Louvre one day and I just have to fly there and come back and fly there and come back. So I fame is good in one point, in the other point, it depends like what we want. Like the activist art is good because they want to create that big F change. So they fight for it and they go for it and they they believe that works and they're doing it. I think that's a good thing. And if there's someone artist thinks that if they become a famous is a good thing, if they work for it, I think it's that's the thing. If they like that the experience is important then I think the experience of becoming a famous, if someone wants to have that experience, is more important than the goal. Day, am I clear, or I'm just mumbling and bumbling? No, that's a, that's all right. I'm, I'm going. I'm going like, what that? That was probably too much of a loaded question. Yeah, it was heavy. <laughs> um, have you exhibited back in Iran since you've been here? No. Is that a goal of yours? Um, I don't think that deep. Um, I, you know, I'm not good with planning. You know that. I just yeah, like but, to do things. You're good at dreaming. I know that. You're oh, you're not good at planning, dreaming. but you do dream. Mm. I haven't been in touch with the galleries in Iran that much. I don't know how the vibe works and how the. Maybe yes. Maybe maybe in one of the galleries I would like to exhibit my work but it become a challenge is that uh yeah i don't know if they i'm not sure if they get my work or would that be like too far behind because i'm in australia and i'm not moving as fast as european artists and iranian artists it's so funny the reason i'm talking about that when i moved to from iran to australia I started using all of those colorful work and I was getting this re heavy reaction. Oh my God, a lot of colors, a lot of colors. And I always telling Bez, oh, my work is too old. I'm so far behind because I was coming from third world country. I was thinking like my style and work is so far beyond and they already passed that stage. And then I constantly were thinking like my work is behind, not actually further but now 10 years I'm here and I see how the ceramics they moving to more using more colors and modern design and things like that I actually started seeing like no my work was 10 years 
away. So that's at least I'm telling that to myself. Like, seeing there was so many use of colors in Australia as well, but not as much as now in the last two years is happening. So I have a similar feeling. Like I'm thinking now Australia is so far away and art is going really slowly. So if I go back to Iran because they are closer to Europe and they get more affected with American style art, European style art, they might move in faster. And maybe there are there are more activist artists there and they don't want to see a mug, maybe as an artwork. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe not. Okay, so hopefully. Hopefully. I I I, I think it would be received. I might well. get arrested if I go. <laughs> Well, I, no, I, we can't have that. No. We can't have that because, you know, occasion, yeah. occasionally I need I need to borrow sugar and, yeah. and stuff like that. So, no, you, you've got to stay around yeah. here, Ellie. I will. I will. Oh, how long are we talking now? Oh, we've been going for 46 minutes. 46 minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap, wrap it up with yeah. one more question. You get, yeah. You're getting tired. Um, no, I can talk for hours and hours. Oh, you People can keep, get tired. You can keep going with, if you want, because I actually haven't thought of a question, mm. to be honest. But yeah. um, should I ask you a question? No, you can You cannot ask me a question. Not not when <laughs> not when I'm on this side of the camera. No, no <laughs> questions can be asked of me. Oh. oh. Um. Do you see a time? One, this is the last question. Do you see a time when you move away? You love doing the mugs. Mm. Do, you, do you see a time when you move away from doing that? I think I have to in one point because um, I'm having a lot of physical body issues, like my joints are not handling the pressure of pottery these days. So I have to leave it making things less, but... I'm, I'm not sure if I stop it 100%. I might make it less, but then I have to find a different way to. Because yeah. the mugs are your like bread and butter almost. You they know, are. My, the, all of the mugs yeah. are ceramics. The functional ceramics yeah. are my bread and butter. So, I mean, what would you do if you weren't doing uh, those? I'm moving more toward teaching ceramics. So, no. Um, I started teaching ceramic when I was 23. So back in Iran, I have five years teaching experience in Iran. And since I moved to Australia, I started even with the broken English, I was teaching ceramic. So I'm moving more toward teaching, which I think the next step for me would be probably I spend more time on teaching kids. And the way that I declare changed my life, I think that would be a amazing thing to have more kids be able to work with clay and having this open space for them to try would you use that time for some fine art things as well mm, yes probably i will have much much more time because i probably earn more money from teaching than making mugs and ceramics because you know with ceramic you can't sell them that much expensive because they are functional stuff even though you spend hours and hours in them, the price would be so cheap. You can't really push them from the boundary of functional objects. It's not like a painting. So probably teaching I will earn more money. So all of the money, they can go into my installation art, which, you know, I won't sell them. It's only one of artwork and then they will be destroyed. So it would be more of spending money in those stuff. So uh, yeah, probably I will spend more time in my fine art. But again, it's question of time and and maybe an exhibition in Iran. Maybe an maybe. exhibition in Iran. Maybe an exhibition in somewhere else. I would like to have exhibition in I don't know Madrid. No, I don't know why I said Madrid. Maybe in, like in a small island that no one goes there or just. Small group of people. Ta Tasmania. Ah, uh, Tasmania. No, That's a small island that no one yeah, goes to. No, and no, no, I need something much, much smaller in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> like one of those mountains in the middle of the ocean, like with 10, 10 or 50 people living there. <laughs> that would be fun. 
I, I think you might struggle to sell, Ellie. Uh, I, <laughs> but I will do my installation. I don't need to sell my installation. It'll, it'll be a know. great show, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, it would be like the uh, installation art I did for my friend's house, the uh, Jacques and Alit house. Do you remember? I do. Yeah. I, I took photos of it, remember? Yeah. 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 That, yeah. <laughs> That, yeah, that was more really like good. That, with a small group of people and no one else would going to see it. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to pop up photos of that now. So. Oh, oh my God. Oh, yeah. Well, no one sees that. They can't see it now. <laughs> well, Ellie, thank you for coming along. No worries. Thank you, you for know, having me. It's been me. a long time coming. We've been, you know, I we've know. delayed this, uh, this conversation. A it's few supposed times. to be the first one. Oh, well, better late than never. <laughs> Thanks, Ellie. Thank you. Thank Thanks, David, for having me.